Chuck Smith. And I'm Carol Matriciana. Welcome to this edition of The Pagan Invasion. As we are beginning our entry into the 21st century, a number of political and spiritual leaders suggest that we are also witnessing the dawning of a new age. During the 1960s, many also who were looking for spiritual fulfillment turned to psychedelic drugs and Eastern mysticism. That experience has now formed the foundation for today's spiritual climate. The flower power generation of a quarter century ago has blossomed into today's New Age movement, a highly sophisticated philosophy that blends pagan religions, evolutionary science, and global politics. By uniting religions, science, and politics under one umbrella, the New Age movement claims to offer a new vision for humankind and is making every effort to usher in a new era of global consciousness. During the 1970s, a scientist named James Lovelock revived and popularized an ancient pagan religious concept that all species and elements on Earth make up one collective organism. That is, humans, plants, rocks and minerals are all part of one cosmic body. It was a proposal he called the Gaia Hypothesis. The Gaia concept teaches that Mother Earth is a goddess, a person able to retaliate. And if we as humanity upset her, she might turn on us just like the white cells of our immune system take action against a dangerous virus. Therefore, a global, ecological, and environmental movement is absolutely necessary for our survival. The British newspaper, The Times, credited the Gaia hypothesis as perhaps the most significant movement in thought in the 1980s. By April 1990, this idea culminated in the largest worldwide demonstration in history, known as Earth Day, a festival acknowledging sacred mother Earth, Gaia, as a spirit life force believed to have nurtured all life forms since the dawn of time. Here we are at Malibu Beach on Earth Day, April 1990, and I'm speaking to Mr. James Coburn, an actor. Mr. Coburn, why, why should we care about Earth Day or Mother Earth? Well, Mother Earth is the mother. She's the mother goddess. She's the one that we should be praising rather than raping. I mean, all of these people here today are here for one reason, because they're concerned about what's happening to the earth, what mankind is doing to the earth. I mean, the negative emotion that we carry around a lot of us is, is another contributor to it. I mean, it all feeds the moon. What we have to do is be true to ourselves. We're true to ourselves. We'll be true to Mother Earth. Mother Earth is going to be bountiful. She's going to give us everything we need. She has for a long time. We've lost our way. The pagans used to know how to do it, and the Indians, some of them, still remember how to do it. The earth is a living organism. We're killing the one we, we love the most, and she loves us. We've got we to gotta praise our mother goddess. Time magazine recently heralded this Gaia reawakening as goddess worship, the effort to create female-centered spiritual expression and get away from a patriarchal father god. Many are looking with great hope to the New Age movement to answer the crisis problems of our day. New Age leaders working through organizations such as the United Nations hope to quickly establish the New World Order. They envision a global community united in its fight against pollution, where religions put away their differences and unite as one, and where world peace is a reality. Indeed, we are on the threshold of a new era. But will the new age be able to deliver on its promise of peace and prosperity? Or is it a facade masking a dark and sinister plan of spiritual deception? Jesus himself warned us that in the last days many would come claiming to be Christ and Messiah. Our landscape today is literally crawling with individuals claiming to be Christ, and the Eastern gurus are right on the top of the list. There are two things the gurus have done. On the one hand, they've used Eastern-type words that are floating about in the West, words like energy, vibrations, and so on. And they've also used words, phrases, ideas from the Bible, from the teaching of Jesus, 
misused them, twisted them around to draw people to themselves, to suggest that the things that Jesus was talking about are actually the things they are talking about when actually it's not so at all. In Holy Bible it has been explained very explicitly that be ye perfect even as your father who is in heavens is perfect and we are also basically the same as he is. The Eastern Gurus, the occultists, cultists of every description have taken the terms of the Bible and felt every liberty to redefine them according to their basic presuppositions. God becomes not a personal individual, a spirit with whom we have a personal relationship through his son Jesus Christ. He becomes an impersonal force. God is uh, something an energy that permeates every one of us, each and every one of us. And it's both uh, personal and non-personal. Jesus becomes not the way, the truth, and the life, but an avatar, a way shower, one of many paths to God. Jesus Christ, of course, was uh, an enlightened master. Bhagwan is another Jesus, another Buddha. Jesus Christ was a great master, like our master is today. The word made flesh, as the Bible puts it. Ernst Winter has a PhD in international law. He was a diplomat in the Austrian Foreign Service for 10 years, and from 1968 through 78 was a director with the United Nations. My greatest concern really is the growing interest and dedication and application of Eastern mystical thought and practices within traditional Christian groups and churches. There's a vacuum, there's a longing. They want to be filled with, quote, religious experience. Today's New Age teachings falsely claim that Hindu spiritual experiences are compatible with Christianity. And the incredible thing is that so many Christian leaders through their books, magazines, sermons, radio and TV programs encourage millions of Christians to seek Christianized Hindu experiences. Many people who are in the Christian church have come to us and have had deeper experiences of spirituality and of God as a result of this meditation. Most Catholic monasteries and most Protestant Bible schools have introduced one system of meditation or another and they are based upon the practices of yoga. Many of the church people and particularly the leaders of the churches and denominations look with great hope to its Eastern mysticism that it would bring new life into a dead body. While infiltrating the Christian church, Eastern mysticism is also powerfully influencing world politics. Under the umbrella of the United Nations, countless New Age groups spread their philosophies worldwide. Many UN leaders, UN agencies, and the World Council of Churches with its deep UN ties promote New Age beliefs and practices. The UN has its own meditation room and resident guru, Sri Chinmoy. Even the United States Pentagon has meditation rooms. A graduate of Harvard School of Divinity, Leland Stewart, directs the Unity and Diversity Council a powerful New Age promotional network that originated with a 1965 directive of the United Nations General Assembly. Unity and Diversity Council is a worldwide coordinating body of what we call it individuals, organizations, and networks looking toward a time in which there will be a one single organized energy of networking throughout the planet under Stewart's leadership in 1982, this group linked arms with Graham Wilson's Mind-Body-Spirit Festivals, forming a vast army dedicated to the merger of all religions into one, under a world leader. I am very interested in the harmony of all religions. It's not just to give birth to another religion, but rather to, to produce, let's call it, a universal religious outlook through which there can be a new connecting of all cultures and all religions, all races. In this growing consciousness of sharing godliness and looking for a leader to uh, uh, lead everyone into this uh, new heaven, the UN plays a very important role in as much as it is a support system. Any group that meets 
to discuss these matters would be very eager and very careful to have UN sponsorship. Our organization has been represented in the United Nations. We have an office there, and this has been going on for approximately five years. We've been involved in all the sessions that are going on in the UN. We've been able to um, watch and participate, offering um, meditations and presentations. How is this possible? I think it became possible by the, the thought and actions of one man in the UN, Robert Mueller who was continuously emphasizing that the UN has to be a support system to this conditioning of man, to this sharing desire, to this uh, uh, looking for a one world government, for one world leader, and playing down, and I believe myself correctly, that the UN is not that world government, that it is a conditioning device, that it is an aid, a support system. It gives prestige to uh, otherwise completely outlandish groups. The Brahma Kumaras World Spiritual University in India is used by the UN and its members for conferences focusing on world peace and unity. Delegates from all over the world, VIPs, are attending to express their ideas and to experience peace in a very real way themselves. This experience will enable them also to draw up new laws for universal peace. This will be endorsed by heads of state and submitted as a practical um, form for the United Nations. Many evenings, uh, the UN building is even used for lectures, talks, uh, meditations, uh, enlightenments, uh, on how to make one better world. The leaders are asked to meditate and be involved because this is part of their instruction, their brainwashing, and all this is part of the conditioning for the vision of a new world or of a new age. Appearing in the film Gods of the New Age is Dave Hunt, an internationally recognized cult expert and best-selling author of more than a dozen books dealing with Eastern mysticism, psychic phenomenon, cults, and the occult. I asked him to share his thoughts concerning the implications of moving toward a new world order. Dave, why are we hearing so much about this new world order? What does that mean? That's most interesting. It was Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, as near as I can recall, who was the first one who mentioned it uh, in Perestroika. Uh, then you had Edvard Sheridnadze before his um, resignation as foreign minister. In September 1990, when he addressed the United Nations, he said, the actions of Saddam Hussein in the Gulf are a threat to a new world order. President Bush is continually talking about the new world order. And what he means by that is that we are going to solve our problems. Finally, the United Nations is going to function as it was designed. The world, for the first time, is united against an aggressor. And we're going to make an example out of Saddam Hussein. We're not going to allow this to happen uh, anymore uh, in the future. You just can't move in and take, take over another country. Um, we are going to have a new world order. It really is going to come. Unfortunately, it will be ruled over by the Antichrist. Uh, people complain and they say, well, uh, Saddam Hussein, I mean, he's only doing what a lot of other people have done. You, you didn't enforce, you know, the actions of the UN against them. How come you're doing it to him? Because it's a new world order. It's something entirely new. The world is united now to bring peace. We're not going to allow aggression. And it, it relates back to paganism and Eastern mysticism. We can, in fact, solve our problems. We have this human potential. We have the power within. And peace will reign on this world. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul warns, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come. He doesn't mean they're whistling Dixie. They're hoping for peace and safety. They think they have achieved it. Uh, you know, the first one who called for a new world order was Satan in his rebellion against God. I will be like the Most High. I will decide. And then Adam and Eve joined uh, in his rebellion, and they brought a new world order. The new world order, what it's all about is the world as man, as God. 
creating his own reality will make as opposed to the world that God intended it to be and it's it's humanism cosmic humanism and we're saying we can solve our problems we can bring peace and safety and prosperity uh, we can solve the problems of evil uh, and of war and of poverty without God without the Prince of Peace now I know Bush claims to be a Christian and I think in many ways he conducts himself like a Christian but unfortunately he's falling into the trap of working for a humanistic solution uh, to the problems of this world and in my opinion and my opinion is based upon the scriptures you will never have peace until the Prince of Peace reigns first in human hearts and then over this world and the New World Order is an attempt to solve our problems without God most people are aware that the United Nations played a major role in the war against Iraq in fact the United Nations was responsible for not only authorizing the use of force but for outlining the terms for a ceasefire. Members of the UN believe that Saddam Hussein stood in the way of the dream of achieving world peace. Behind the scenes, the UN has for years been working toward a united world government as well as a united world religion. Not surprising, many of its members have been actively involved in participating and promoting Eastern religious meditation techniques. Actually, we're being prepared for the surrender to an authority in a way that perhaps we don't realize. We are going through right now strange bathing in Eastern concepts of consciousness, states of consciousness, bliss, reincarnation, energies, vibrations, all of these words that have become very commonplace really in the, the Western languages are also modifying our mind. They are changing our way of thinking. And this changed way of thinking puts us into a, a mental state state, if you'd like, and prepares our um, intellectual functionings for the surrender. More than ever before, the human race seems willing to surrender spiritually and emotionally to a charismatic leader who can offer peace and prosperity to a world trembling on the brink of ecological and social collapse, international financial chaos, and a nuclear holocaust. Well-known New Ager Benjamin Krem claims to be the coming world leader's advanced public relations man. In 1982, full-page advertisements around the world announced the coming of Krem's New Age Christ, which gave fresh hope to millions. At this press conference in Los Angeles, he described how this Christ would make himself known. It is a truism today to say that we are at the dawn of a new age the age of Aquarius. And it is important to remember that all of the great religions await the coming of a teacher. The Christians await the return of the Christ. The Muslims await the Imam Mahdi. At the same time, the Buddhists await the coming of another Buddha. The Hindus await the return of Krishna. And the Jews, as always, await the coming of the Messiah. I am speaking today about the return of such a teacher Simultaneously, throughout the world will take place hundreds of thousands of spontaneous healings and cures, which will reinforce, if that were even necessary, the fact that it is the Christ himself. The Day of Declaration will be the outstanding event of this or any other century. On that day, the radio and the television networks of the world will be linked together. We shall see this extraordinary face on our television screens. But he will not speak. His words will drop silently into our minds in our own language. This is the significance of the altered state of consciousness reached in yoga and other forms of Eastern meditation. A Nobel Prize winner has described the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate, unquote. What that means is, 
in an altered state of consciousness, the connection between my spirit that normally operates my brain and my brain is loosened, and that allows another spirit being to interpose itself, begin to tick off the neurons in the brain, create an entire universe of illusion, astral travel, give psychic powers. In this way, the world is being prepared for some ultimate delusion. He will indeed inaugurate a great new world religion, and at the very most sacred core of that new world religion will be the process which is called the esoteric initiations, which take us out of the strictly human kingdom into the kingdom of God. David Spangler, board member of the Planetary Initiative for the World We Choose, which comes out of the United Nations, declares that Lucifer is the same force as Christ, that Lucifer prepares us for our own Christhood, that this is the final Luciferic initiation into the New Age. Benjamin Krems Christ may not be the world teacher and ruler of world peace as he forecasted, but without question the stage is being set today for what the Bible calls the apostasy or man's abandonment of God. This climate is ushering in the final actor, the counterfeit, who the Bible predicts must come before the return of Jesus, the true Prince of Peace, who will then reign for a thousand years. The Dalai Lama is playing a key role right now uh, in this whole thing, this whole scheme, you might say. Uh, he's been traveling around the world, and, and I find this absolutely astonishing. He's been traveling around the world initiating people into what he calls um, Tibetan Buddhist deity yoga, where he teaches us that we are little bodhisattvas, little Buddhas. He says, everybody is a Buddha, and I can train you through an initiation ceremony, basically initiating you into yoga, uh, into this altered state of consciousness, and I will teach you that you are God, and you create reality with your own mind through visualization, and this is how we're going to bring peace to this world. Now, of course, the media laughs at him. No, they don't. They take the man seriously. And they take him so seriously that he was given the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, I find that astonishing. <laughs> that a man who's going to bring peace by turning us into gods who create reality with our mind, he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. The influence of the Dalai Lama around the world is, and in the political realm, and in the religious realm, is astonishing. He's embraced. He becomes a spokesperson for peace. Uh, and he is one of the prime movers at the peace conferences. One of the reasons for this is that the political leaders now recognize, and I think it's in preparation for the revival of the Roman Empire and, and the coming of the Antichrist, they now recognize you can't have political peace, military peace, without religious peace. I mean, some of our major problems in the world are religious uh, problems. Hindus against Buddhists uh, in Pakistan or India or wherever it may be, or Muslims against Christians and so forth. And they recognize we're going to have to have not just a one world government, but a one world religion. And so the Dalai Lama has becomes the spokesperson for a broad-minded ecumenism that embraces uh, everything. Now, interestingly enough, Gorbachev is making the same kind of noises. He said, tolerance is the alpha and omega of the new world order. Now, this is a man who was baptized as a Christian, you know, into the Orthodox Church. He knows that Jesus Christ claims to be the Alpha and Omega. It's a slap in the face to Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And Gorbachev says that tolerance for all religions, for all beliefs, is going to be the Alpha and Omega of the New World Order. Now, you know that he means tolerance, in fact, for everything except one thing, and that is Jesus Christ, who claims to be the only way. You know what Hinduism will do, for example. Hinduism will accept all religions. We call this the embrace that smothers. Oh, we'll accept Jesus, of course. Uh, 
But when we accept Jesus, he's no longer the Jesus of the Bible, but he's a Hindu avatar. Uh, just another, another one of, of the many ways. And so this is the, the tolerance that, that they're talking about. And it really is the destruction of, of Christianity. And it doesn't make sense. I mean, I wouldn't want to go to a, I wouldn't want to buy bread, for example, from a baker who says, oh, what does it matter what you put in, nails and, and ground glass and so forth? I mean, why follow a recipe? Or, or a doctor who says, um, uh, you ask him for the diagnosis and the prognosis, and he says, well, what would you like? So this idea that anything goes, that all religions work, um, they have to embrace this in order to bring peace among religions. Uh, that's absolutely contrary uh, to Scripture. But it's coming into the church, even among evangelicals, who now become soft on the gospel, and let's not offend people, and we'll try to tone it down, and finally, you don't really have a solution to the problem anymore. What are some of the political dangers in religious tolerance and ecumenicalism? Hitler, for example claim to be a Christian, the real Christianity, positive Christianity. Uh, National Socialism is positive Christianity. And just like um, Saddam Hussein, who invokes the name of Allah, Hitler invoked the name of God in his speeches. Uh, we claim the blessing of Almighty upon our efforts, you know. And if you don't define who God is, and if you have a, a vague God, some higher power, uh, who has no real principles, there isn't a definite truth involved in this, then this becomes an umbrella for almost anything. Saddam Hussein is a megalomaniac. He uses the name of God for his own rebellion against God and against the laws of God, against morality and ethics and, and the laws of, 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 of the world and of the United Nations and so forth. So, uh, rebellion is in the heart of man, and he, the worst rebellion that there is, the worst evil in this world is when you use God as a cover for your own ego and, and what you want to do. And ultimately, it prepares the way for the Antichrist. Now, we are really moving in this direction. Uh, some of the statements by Gorbachev, for example, are absolutely incredible. In his book, Perestroika, he said, it's not going to just be Western Europe that will be united, but there's going to be a united Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals. The Russians, we're going to be part of this united Europe. And can you believe the reason he gave for it? He said, because we are Christians. Here was the head of world atheism, world communism, where they've been trying to destroy Christianity, and now he's posing as a Christian. And he says, we're a Christian nation. Well, obviously, he didn't mean born-again, Bible-believing, evangelical Christianity, like you and I mean. He meant an, ev a an ecumenical, false Christianity that embraces all religions of the world. Now, when Gorbachev wanted to further his perestroika and glasnost and the opening up and the transformation of the Soviet Union. He didn't go to Nashville, Tennessee to meet with the, with the head of the Southern Baptist Convention. He went to Rome to meet with the Pope. Uh, he re recognized that he needed the help of Rome, the most powerful uh, religious leader uh, on earth. And there is a growing, <coughs> um, a growing partnership uh, Newsweek uh, reported that every week both Gorbachev and President Bush consult the Pope. So there's a growing partnership between politics and religion. And I think it's paving the way for uh, the Antichrist. The revived Roman Empire isn't going to be just a military political entity, but a religious entity ruled by an emperor who is God. And we're back to paganism again. Uh, by the way, um, the Dalai Lama is one of the Pope's closest friends, and you have a dialogue going on between uh, Buddhist monks and Catholic monks uh, to arrive at a commonality and so forth. But when the Pope addressed large Hindu audiences in New Delhi and Calcutta, I was absolutely astonished what he said. You can get this out of 
the Pope Speaks, a publication put out by the Vatican, or Observatoire Romano, the official publication of the Vatican. And the Pope said that India's chief contribution to humanity is its spiritual vision of man. And he says the world does well to heed uh, and learn uh, the spiritual vision of man that India is offering. Um, he said that we haven't come here to teach you something. We've come here to learn from your rich spiritual heritage. It's an embrace of paganism, literally. Uh, you remember in 1986 when he got... Uh, I think 60 leaders of the 12 uh, major religions of the world to gather at Assisi uh, for prayer. Now, some of these are fire worshippers. These are pagans, um, animus, uh, and so forth. And he said all of the prayers of all of these people to whatever God they're praying to are creating um, a spiritual energy that is bringing about peace uh, in this world. So paganism invades um, uh, the Episcopalian Church. Um, it invades the Methodists, uh, the Presbyterians, the Protestants, the Catholics, right up to the, to the Vatican. Uh, and I would say that we are heading definitely for a one world religion. It won't be new. It will be the old paganism dressed up in Christian terminology. Now that's what is most interesting to me uh, because we're preparing the world and the church for the Antichrist. Anti in Greek has two meanings. The one that we most often associate with it, uh, which is opposed to or against. But it also has another meaning, in the place of or as a substitute for. And I believe that the Bible uh, teaches that the Antichrist will embody both meanings. He will oppose Christ in the most diabolically clever way he could, and anything less would not be worthy of Satan's genius. He will oppose Christ by pretending to be Christ. Now, if he does that, then his followers must be what? Christians. That means we must, this is why Paul said that day will not come except there's a great apostasy of falling away. We must have in this world a Christianity, quote unquote, that embraces all religions, including paganism. A Christianity that can be accepted by Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, fire worshippers, you know, animus, everything. Uh, and I believe that it's under the umbrella of this false Christianity uh, that all religions will be united and they will worship the Antichrist as God. Now, I find it very interesting that the wall is down. It's incredible what's happened. Uh, the Berlin Wall is down. Uh, Eastern Germany is suddenly united with Western Germany. It couldn't happen for a hundred years, so they said. Now we've got Hungary and Poland and Czechoslovakia. They're all joining in. Uh, the Warsaw Pact is dissolved. Russia says, we're going to be part of this. And ultimately, uh, we're going to see a, a world, a new world religion. Now, what, what was the religion of the Roman Empire? Well, it was paganism, first of all. And the Bible says that religion is going to be revived. I believe that the Antichrist will, in fact, be the new emperor, the new Constantine over the revived Roman Empire, which is why we have to have a falling away, we have to have a false Christianity, we have to have, in fact, a pagan invasion of the church, as well as of politics and of our world, of society, and we have to have a paganized Christianity, which is what happened to Christianity under Constantine. And we must have a paganized Christianity and a apostate church that will be the bride of the Antichrist, just as uh, the true church is the bride of Christ. Now in Revelation 17, you have an incredible uh, picture there. The woman rides the beast. The beast is the revived Roman Empire. The beast is the Antichrist, and it's the woman, the church, who exercises authority, who is 
riding this beast. It shows the importance that religion will have, that paganism, this revived paganism and mysticism, uh, this whole uh, religious trip is going to have uh, in this new world order. Many political and religious leaders today are working toward a united new world order. While they hope this will be the beginning of a time of world peace, the Judeo-Christian Bible predicts that this will ultimately result in untold horrors and destruction. Ignoring this clear warning, however, the world continues to move forward with its plans. Today's revival of paganism and Hindu practices, which form the heart of the New Age movement, was ironically the same kind of foundation that prepared the way for Hitler's rise to power. The Germany of the 20s and 30s was in social and economic despair and looked for a leader who would free them from the Great Depression. The man with a promise of hope was Adolf Hitler, who claimed he was ordained of God to usher in 1,000 years of peace and prosperity. His hypnotic powers manipulated an entire nation to surrender its collective mind to him. Obsessed with the occult, Hitler drew many of his bizarre ideas from Hinduism. He took the symbol of the swastika as his own, a Hindu symbol of power seen in many of today's temples in India. Millions of Germans who submitted to Hitler as though he were God died for him and his cause, much like the followers of Jim Jones. The current worldwide revival of Hinduism blended with psychology and disguised as self-improvement, self-hypnosis, positive mental attitude seminars, visualization techniques, and mind dynamics courses has made today's world far more susceptible to spiritual deception than the Germany that embraced Adolf Hitler. Today, a desperate world is looking for another spiritual leader. Has the human race learned nothing from its own mistakes? It is interesting that they are saying that man has now come to the next stage of his evolutionary development. And that is that transition from man into the universal consciousness of God. We hear so much about global peace, global government, global unification. This is only a foreshadowing of what the Bible tells us of the one world government that will be headed by the Antichrist that will not bring global peace but will actually bring the greatest war that man has ever seen or ever known. Again, man trying to substitute for God, but it never works. Man's sciences and man's ideas cannot bring him into that universal peace or global peace that the world desires so much. It will not happen apart from the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, who will establish God's kingdom upon the earth, and at that time they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. But we await for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ for true global peace. Within all of us, there is a God-shaped vacuum. Throughout the ages, man has attempted to fill that void with the things of the world. But it is only through a relationship with our Creator that we can be truly satisfied. His holy scriptures reveal the way in which we can be reconciled to God, and that is through the provisions of His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm Chuck Smith. 
and I'm Carol Matriciana. Join us again for another edition of The Pagan Invasion.